hate to break this to you, but there's a conspiracy behind the, behind the modern Bible translation controversy, which is not only undermining Christianity, but it's also undermining our civilization at this very moment. My name is Joseph Armstrong, and welcome to the Bible version conspiracy. We're building a uh, searchable online resource where you guys can uh, explore not only uh, the conspiracy that we believe is behind the modern Bible version, consp uh, the modern Bible version controversy, but it will also explore the uh, very interesting points in Bible history and explore the King James Bible, its history and its divine character. If you care to join us on a little deeper level, you can go to our Buy Me a Coffee page, which is below in the description. There are some benefits of being a co-conspirator, and you can check them out on our Buy Me a Coffee page. And it is our co-conspirators that make this live stream and our other content possible. We thank you for being co-conspirators. You know who you are. Thank you for being awesome. Stick around till to the end of tonight's stream because it's going to keep getting weirder and weirder as we explore the topics that you want to talk about and the topics that I already have in my mind. So let's jump into the first one. We have been privileged recently. We've been invited on a fairly good, a good sized YouTube channel by Nick Sayers, who does a lot of long form content dealing specifically with the uh, Texas Receptus and the modern Bible translation controversy. He does a lot of work on uh, all of the streams that he does. He's done a lot of research, and I appreciate the opportunity to join him. It'll be next Saturday. I will be posting about it sometime this week. Not sure all of the topics that we're going to explore, but he has sent me some things that he has drawn from our content that he would like to talk about, and I'm sure that there's going to be a lot more. I appreciate you guys joining us. Like I said, it makes me feel bad to be looking at a zero, but that's okay. I know that you're there still. Because a lot of people like to watch this in, out of browser and stuff and just listen to the audio, which is just fine. And also it's an unusual time because it's an hour earlier from when we usually go live with our co-conspirators to record the podcast episodes. So. Nick Sayers, keep him in prayer, please, because his wife is suffering in her health. He did not go into specifics, but definitely keep her in prayer and um, keep my nephew in prayer as well. He is uh, he is struggling with his health right now. And uh, he um, yeah, he, he is struggling. So please keep him in prayer. I don't know how many specifics they would want me to go into publicly, so I won't. I will forbear. <clears throat> Nick, actually, speaking of Nick Sayers, he's been watching our live, not our live streams necessarily, but he used to watch all of our old content way, way back when we used to be on YouTube making as long a video as I could possibly put together and reading a parts of books and everything like this. And uh, he used to enjoy all of it and uh, reached out to me uh, on an occasion to get some information from James White's book that I owned, that I still own. And uh, yeah, it was it was interesting to um, to go back and hear all of that history that we have had together. Let's jump in to the West Cotton Hort page, because we have been exploring this a lot on our live streams recently, and it's ugh, it's just been some crazy stuff that we've been realizing. And I'm actually, at this point, I will say, I'm actually kind of glad that the audiobook of New Age Bible versions didn't work out. I'm actually kind of glad. Well, Okay, I think we can explore it without the mouse. It would just be so much easier to have a cursor. Is this... That fingerprint doesn't show. Eh, anyways, it'll work. All right, so this is something that we've been exploring recently in our, uh, um, in our podcast streams. We've been talking a lot about Westcott and Hort. And... Uh, 
it looks like, guys, that we're being lied to by everybody. Like, everybody. So, it's crazy. <clears throat> I've been enjoying the videos by Mark Ward and the uh, Textual Confidence Collective. It seems like most of them, at least Ward and Berg, were raised King James only. And they were told the standard lines, like we've all been told, about West Cotton Hort this and West Cotton Hort that. They denied de the deity of Christ, and they denied the virgin birth, and they denied the errancy of scripture, and they denied the blood of Christ, and they were occultists and heretics and sorcerers and Rosicrucians and Jesuits and all of that stuff. All of the stuff. And I'm starting to realize how little evidence there actually is for it. And I'm being shocked, surprised. Shocked probably would not be hyperbole. However, when it comes to the Textual Confidence Collective and they talk about the, oh, they're being misrepresented here, they're being misrepresented there. Yeah, they are being misrepresented an awful lot. But there's some things where I'm just like, that they don't get quite right in my opinion. The first of these being that Cursop Lake talks about Westcott and the bodily resurrection and how he didn't exactly believe it, but kind of did. So it's really a a, a strange concept. We we went on into this in a in a former stream where we actually read the entire quotation by Cursop Lake. The long short of it is that Westcott and I guess a lot of other people at the time had a tendency to take doctrines that were accepted and rephrase them in a way that you believed exactly the opposite. So like with the bodily resurrection, for example, and you guys can go to our website, BibleVersionConspiracy.com slash Westcott and Hort. Spell it all out as one word. And when you read this quotation by Cursop Lake, he is uh, <clears throat> he's saying that basically when Westcott says something about the bodily resurrection, he's talking about the spiritual body being resurrected, which means that you don't have resurrection of the flesh anymore. So. Uh, the doctrine is rewritten in a way that looks like it's correct, but then the way that it actually is, is like it's completely the opposite of what it should be. So another example of this, if you go for it anyways, is uh, eternal versus everlasting. If you have everlasting punishment in hell, then that means that it is lasting ever. So like it doesn't stop. If you define eternal as ending at some point in the future, then that means that you don't have eternal punishment in hell. It's a, it's a very interesting way of putting things for sure. And Cursop Lake is coming along after, I, I believe, after Westcott died. And he's basing this on uh, Westcott's work in the Church of England and his writings and stuff like this. And that's under the section that you guys can check out. Lake spots the fake. So let's maneuver on down. That's the, uh, the article underneath his picture. The Immortality and the Modern Mind is the book that it comes from. You click the link, it takes you to the page in the book, which is so awesome about Google Books these days because you can actually go to the book and you can actually look at it and you can go, oh my goodness. And you can be disappointed in the people that you trusted with the facts and the truth. And you can be like, I'm double checking every quotation they ever make from now on. 
like I'm having to do now. So here's a list. <clears throat> I finally spelled heresy correctly, I believe. Here's a list of different accusations. There are more. Let me make this so you guys can see it a little better. So there's a list of the different accusations that come against Westcott and Hort. Apparently, yes. He's very racist. At least apparently the Textual Confidence Collective agrees with that accusation. These all say non-confirmed right now because I have not personally confirmed them. They are accusations that have come from authors that, based on the information that you will see later on on this page, I no longer trust these authors. Right now, I am more interested in this topic than ever. I want to hear, I want to see, I want to double check everything now because I think that it's necessary. And, and, I'll go a little bit further. I can't say it dogmatically yet, but it seems to me that Westcott and Hort and uh, the jargon that surrounds them, so like occultist, homosexual, denying the blood of Christ, deity of Christ, all these different keywords that could be, thro say, thrown into a search engine. And remember, King James Onlyism has exploded with the advent of the internet. These different keywords surrounding these guys' names and the amount of internet entries that include them. They're, in my opinion, going to be drowning out something that may be a real conspiracy. So, right now, we see the word Jesuit associated with West Cotton Hort, occultism associated with West Cotton Hort, changing the Bible associated with West Cotton Hort, all these different things. And when you have uh, the New Order of Barbarians, where they're where they were open in 69, 1969, and Richard Day was open about it, that they were planning to change the Bible, that they were going to be introducing keyword synonyms to uh, take doctrines break them down and mold them into the shape of a new world religion. And they admitted to this. When something like that is legit and we have a whole bunch of false information surrounding Westcott and Hort who are doing key words along these lines or at least being accused of it. So for instance, changing the Bible denying the deity of Christ, the blood atonement, uh, occultism, sodomy, and things like this, all these different key words. Th it's easy to take things that are actually being done and bury them underneath the, uh, the uh, rubble, the uh, pile of information that is put out against a couple of scapegoats. I don't know at this point enough to say, but I will say that sometimes my theories are a little bit more accurate and scary than I hope they will be. I'm always just like, man, I hope I'm not right, and then I end up being right, and it's just like, ah. So, if West Cotton Hort were scapegoats, that's game-changing. Because if they took the brunt of King James only wrath for no reason, and King James only people should have gotten upset at a group that is actually making changes and actually causing real problems, not just revising archaic words in the King James Bible, 
if that's the case, then first of all, we haven't been doing our job. Second, shame on the people that promoted the stuff about Westcott and Hort that was not true. And third, we need to have a focus. If you want to say it, King James Onlyism needs to have a paradigm shift. I know that's a big buzzword these days, but we can use it, I guess. And needs to redirect its focus. Let's continue on down the page, and you'll see what I mean about the misrepresentation. I don't, like I said in streams where we've dealt with this already, I don't want to be too harsh on the people that have looked into this stuff. I don't want to be too harsh on Gip, Grady, Ruckman. Oh, what's that guy's name? I can never remember his name. Oh, D.A. Waite. I think I already mentioned Gail Ripplinger. I don't want to be too hard on them. I don't know where they got their information. I don't know if most of the people writing after 1993 are all referring back to Gale, and if Gale's referring back to D.A. Waite, and D.A. Waite kind of just got it from Benjamin Wilkinson or something. I haven't followed the rabbit trail down that far, but I will say that it is an absolute crying shame some of the misquotations of West Cotton Hort that I have found. First, I was first. I first I was like, okay, well, that's quite a quote there when I read it in New Age Bible versions. I was just like, wow, they denied inerrancy right there. He said right there, he denied the infallib infallibility or inerrancy. I forget. I think it's infallibility. He denied the term overwhelmingly. Therefore, he denied infallibility of the Bible and did not believe that it was inspired or anything. Textual Confidence Collective, just recently listening to some of their stuff, they're like, well, the inerrant versus infallible versus this and that is very nuanced, especially at that point in Anglicanism. So there's a lot to be considered. And Westcott rejected the word infallibility for a different reason than what you would think, where he was just like, oh, I don't think the Bible's God's word at all. Hort actually had a lot more misgivings than Westcott did. Westcott apparently actually had a much more orthodox view of the Bible, and much more than King James only has given credit for. But I didn't have the textual confidence collective at this point. What I had, where I arrived at the realization of this being a misquotation, was I had New Age Bible versions, read it, went on, years and years go by. Okay, I get a book by Joey Faust called The Word God Will Keep It, 400-Year History of the King James Bible Only Movement. He has a couple of chapters in there that deal a little bit more with West Cotton Hort. You've got the uh, the Necromancy of West Cotton Hort, that's the big one. And then there's other ones like the the Most Hated Book and, and um, a few other parts like um, uh, the uh, Roman Catholic Scheme, actually, that's a section. Um, there's different parts in there where he talks about West Cotton Hort. And in one of those parts, he brings in the same quotation that Gail Ripplinger did. Gail Ripplinger had it in a nice little package. It began with a capital letter. There were no ellipses, none at all. And there was a nice little period right at the end. And it had little quotation marks around it. And it was all perfectly fine. Until Joey Faust. Joey Faust. Oh boy. We we need a talk. We we need a talk. Okay. Trying to keep what I can say publicly right now. Joey Foss goes and throws a wrench into the works by a simple little means that are available now on a computer. A simple little function called copy and paste. Joey Faust did the irresponsible thing to the misquotation, but the responsible thing to the readers, the consumers of information, you and I. 
he did the responsible thing for us by taking the quotation, the same exact quotation that Gail Ripplinger did. Let's take a look at it. Come on, I poked you. There you go. <clears throat> We're going to scroll right down past Lake Spots the Fake. Gail's really bad in this quote. You guys can check this all out. The Rejection of Infallibility. Westcott is often quoted as saying, I reject the word infallibility of Holy Scriptures overwhelmingly. I see, that makes grammatical sense. And I am also streaming this on our group, Friends of Gail Ripplinger. I support Gail Ripplinger and a lot of her work. I think that she gave us a lot of good information. I am not the Textual Confidence Collective. I am not James White. I am not David Cloud. I am not any of these people that ranked, placed, or showed in her book, Blind Guides. I am not one of these people. I did an entire series, which we need to redo, on Blind Guides on my former YouTube channel. I am well aware of the criticisms that she has faced. And I want to revisit it because I don't remember the exact answer that she gave to the criticism of this quotation. But I will say that what I am looking at, to me, feels like dishonesty. Gail, I love you. You know I do. But girl, honestly, let's take a look and you'll see what I mean. Westcott is often quoted as saying, I reject the word infallibility of Holy Scriptures overwhelmingly. But what did he actually say? Sadly, Gail Ripplinger's quotation is the furthest removed from the actual quote. I have not found D.A. Waite's word-for-word -word quotation of Westcott in this passage of Westcott's writings yet. I need to go find D.A. Waits. I've got to go find Benjamin Wilkinson's if he made one. I've got to go find everybody's that goes anything like this because I don't know if, I don't know, I have not asked Gail yet. If she sees this or if Bryn sees this, then please tell me, enlighten me. If Gail came up with this rendering, which is grammatically correct, which has three distinct changes from the original quotation in it, If she came up with this, I'm just like, oh, man. If she just borrowed it from somebody else's reference, it's like, weren't you supposed to go check the original source? What did the, quote, what did the quotation actually say? Gail Ripplinger's quotation is the furthest removed from the actual quote. Compare the reading of New Age Bible versions to the actual letter Westcott wrote below. And we give you the entire letter. This is what's available to us now in the digital age. And if you guys have questions or comments, please put them in the comment section. I want to hear from you guys. I want to talk about, I want to go into things deeper. If you're just like, hey, could you, you know, could you go back? Whatever you need me to do. Leave it in the comment section. I'm not sure that I'm going to see comments that are put on Facebook. Sometimes it won't. If you're able to leave comments on YouTube, that would be best. So, back to the page. The quotation, as it reads in Gail Ripplinger's book, here's how it is. <clears throat> I reject the word infallibility of Holy Scriptures overwhelmingly. This is from the current edition. I'd like to emphasize this. This is from the current edition of New Age Bible versions. It's not from this one. This is the old, the old one that's got like the globby text and everything. We're talking about this one with the gray dragon. New Age Bible versions. 2021, page 681. Let's go to that.
Yep, right toward the bottom of the page. I reject the word infallibility of Holy Scriptures overwhelmingly. It has the same layout, same spacing, the same force justification on that middle line there of Holy Scriptures. All the same stuff, exactly the same today. Sounds pretty bad, right? I reject the word infallibility of Holy Scriptures overwhelmingly. That's nice. But is it true to the source? Joey Foss writing on the four the hundred excuse me, the four hundred year history of the King James KJV only movement gets closer thanks to copy paste because he actually went to the Google Book resource, looked it up, copied it and pasted it. How do I know that? Because he did that for a lot of his stuff. He didn't even include page numbers because that's a resource that's available today that you can go to google books you can look something up based on keywords you don't even need a page number so he didn't even supply page numbers in his book <clears throat> but he still falls short of telling the whole story and sounds sort of suspicious if you read it carefully so this is where I was like, I need to go check this for myself. This is before I ever heard Mark Ward's name, I think. This is before the uh, Textual Confidence Collective. This is after I had been through uh, um, Blind Guides several times, publicly, once on YouTube, reading the entire thing and responding and reacting and reviewing, and through New Age Bible versions three or four times which this was years ago, so don't don't quiz me on my knowledge of New Age Bible versions because I have not memorized the entire thing. I remember different parts of it. So anyways, but anyways. Copy, paste, where was I? Okay. Here's where it gets weird. And here's where I was like, Wait a second. There's more to this quote than meets the eye. So New Age Bible Version says, I reject the word infallibility of Holy Scriptures overwhelmingly. No punctuation, no ellipsis. Joey Faust, the word God will keep it. PDF page 19. You guys can click that handy little link right there. The one underneath the quotation, it'll take you to, I believe it takes you to our Buy Me a Coffee shop where you can actually grab a free PDF of Joy Foss's book. I highly recommend it. It's got some really good stuff in it. But this part, I'm just like, wait a second. So the quotation, the way he puts it, has lipsis marks. It has a dash. And it doesn't have the same, what is that called? The same endings of words? Suffix? Yeah. I'm pretty sure. I sucked at grammar. It was awful. My, but my grammar was a wonderful lady. So here's the quotation from Joy Faust. My dear Hort, dot, dot, dot. I reject the word infallibility, dash, of Holy Scripture overwhelming. Check this out. You've got, I reject the word infallibility all the same until you get to infallibility you have a dash and i was like wait a second a dash is used like a parenthesis a dash is used at the beginning or the ending of a parenthetical statement that you want to emphasize a parenthesis is for something that's of less importance that you think is still necessary to include. <clears throat> so I was like, there's, there's more before the word I and reject. And it's covered up by those three little dots. Those ones right there. And this is a screen capture from Joey Foss's PDF. Sorry. A little weird. <clears throat> so I decided, hey, I'm going to go look at the Google Book quotation. And what I found shocked me. 
Thankfully, Google Books has brought millions of old books within the reach of the common conspiracy theorist like moi. Here is a screen capture of the actual letter from the Life and Letters of Brooke Foss Westcott, DD, DCL, sometime Bishop of Durham by author Westcott, page 207. There is a newer edition, which is abridged, which is, um, I believe, from 1905, if I'm not mistaken. This isn't helping me out. The, uh, the book, though, I believe is from 1903, this one that references page 207, but it's exactly the same in the abridged one. Two years later, I believe it was. If Gail didn't borrow her sad misquotation from someone, some, someone, careless author, <laughs> well, what, a, what a place to have a typo, careless author. Let me rephrase that. If Gail didn't borrow her sad misquotation from some careless author, this is the very same page that she would have been looking at when creativity struck and knocked out the precise truth from the citation. Mr. Hort. This is uh, introduction part here on the top. This letter is written to Hort from Westcott. The end part there that mentions the Apocrypha, that part is, I believe, added by Westcott's son, Arthur. My dear Hort, I am very glad to have seen both your note and Lightfoot's. Glad, too, that we have had such an opportunity of openly speaking. For I, too, quote, he's quoting Westcott, I believe, must disclaim setting forth infallibility. Now, there is a huge debate about infallibility and inerrancy and stuff like this. I believe inerrancy is a more modern term, and it's not actually accepted by Bible scholars as a whole. From what I, from what I understand, it's actually considered to be a newer term that has not proven itself yet, the term inerrancy. So infallibility is the more classic term. But in Anglicanism at that time, it was considered a term that people were just like, eh. So there's a lot of nuance to this. It's not all just cut and dry. Nope. Okay. They didn't believe the Bible. They didn't think this or that. And, you know, it's like, I want to look at the other quotations about, like, what they thought about miracles. I want to look at that more in depth. I want to look at um, the, the ideas about um, uh, Adam and Eve more in depth. All of this different stuff. But... Recognize that there's a nuance here. Let's keep going. In the front of, so he's, is, he must disclaim setting forth infallibility in the front of his convictions. Uh, that's exactly the same thing that Anglicans today say, is that they don't set forth infallibility on the front of their convictions. Now remember, in a couple of seconds here, we're going to get to a quote from Mrs. Ripplinger that is supposed to have said, I reject the word infallibility of Holy Scripture overwhelming. I reject the infallibility of Holy Scripture's overwhelming. Lee. The actual words like Joey Foss provided. Here, uh, my dear Hort, I reject the word infallibility of Holy Scripture, not plural, overwhelming, not overwhelming Lee. So it had to get a little bit doctored up to be in New Age Bible versions for some reason. And like I said, for the new viewers, guys, I'm not criticizing Gail Ripplinger. Like your standard, oh, you're a King James Bible tonight. No, I'm a King James Bible believer. But I'm looking at New Age Bible versions, which I still promote and still recommend. And I'm still just like, wow, there's some good stuff in it. But this is not a... This is not a bright corner. This is a sad misquotation, and I am willing to be honest about it. If no other person that believes the King James Bible and likes Gail Ripplinger's book is willing to admit that there is an error in her book, I want to be that person. Okay, here we go. For I, too, must disclaim setting forth infallibility in the front of my convictions. All I hold is 
that the more I learn, the more I am convinced that fresh doubts come from my own ignorance. Now, this was the position to have back then, because when there were a lot of people saying that there were contradictions and historical inaccuracies in the Bible and stuff, Christians were going, you know, there's a lot in there that we don't have all the information on yet. The Hittites haven't been discovered yet by archaeology, but we still believe that they existed because they're mentioned in the Bible. We don't think they were just made up. So that's where he's saying, I am convinced that fresh doubts come from my own ignorance and that at present I find the presumption in favor of absolute truth. So he would say, okay, I have a Bible. Where's my Bible? I have a Bible, and it is absolutely true as far as infallibility. He said that he rejected the word infallibility of Holy Scripture over... Hang on. Hang on. Let's read that again. You might think that what he's saying, if you read, I reject the word infallibility of Holy Scripture overwhelming, it makes no sense. It makes no grammatical sense. That little spot right there that has those two little dashes on either side of it, that's a parenthetical statement. Take that out, which you can do. It's just an emphasized part that he thought should be there. Here's what it actually says as a coherent thought. All I hold is, is that the more I learn, the more I am convinced that fresh doubts come from my own ignorance, and that at present I find the presumption in favor of the absolute truth of Holy Scripture overwhelming. So he's saying there are fresh doubts that are coming in from my own ignorance, and Westcott was actually the more orthodox out of him and Hort, because Hort was younger and, you know, more, you know, progressive, I suppose. Hort was more of a, you know, a real, you know classical uh, high church stickler kind of person from what i can tell i find the presumption in favor of the absolute truth of holy scripture overwhelming so presuming that the scripture is absolutely true in the faith in the face of fresh doubts coming in he said i'm sorry the evidence for the absolute truth of scripture is overwhelming he denied infallibility, though, obviously, because he was Anglican and he was a text critic. And uh, the term infallibility probably hadn't even proved itself by this point, just like the word inerrancy hasn't now. I believe it, I believe it's that way. You'd have to check with uh, Van Cleek on that one, I believe. He talked about that with Nick Sayers the other day. I feel, um, of course, I feel difficulties which at present I cannot solve and which I never hope to solve. So like the contradictions that Jardis Bao talks about in, um, oh, what's that book? The Book of Bible Problems. Westcott probably never would have solved one of those. He was busy with a lot of other things and he may not have had the capacity for it. Jardis Bao went through all the different contradictions that he could find and found explanations for all of them that were incredible so that was a quotation that was ripped out of its context by someone i'm assuming gail ripplinger borrowed it from i'm assuming that she borrowed it <clears throat> she may have changed it taken out the dash, taken out all the ellipsis marks, because the letter I is capitalized when you're talking about a person, so you don't really, it looks like the beginning of a sentence. And then adding an S to the end of scripture, and then at, adding a, a Lee to the end of overwhelmingly, so it sounds more grammatically correct. The temptation is, I'm sure, very strong. Joey Faust, of course, he didn't do that. He went and he just copied and pasted it. Right? Like a total numbskull messing up the quotation. Thank you, Joey, for doing that. Because if you hadn't copied and pasted it out of there, I might not have noticed that there was a little dash there and that there was a little bit more to the story. And I may never have gone to the actual book and looked up the actual quotation and seen that 
he was affirming the absolute truth of scripture. And not in fact, and seeing it for myself, I could have seen that from somebody like James White. I could have seen it like from somebody like David Cloud or who, I don't know. I could have seen it from Doug Kutlick. And I would have been like, oh yeah, sure, whatever. I don't trust you as a King James Bible believer. I'm not supposed to trust you because you're against Gail Ripplinger. But it took Joey Foss, somebody that I was supposed to agree with on the Bible translation debate, and was writing along the same lines as Gail Ripplinger, and for him to go and copy and paste and leave that dash raised my suspicions, and I went and I saw it myself, and I was just like, well, looks like Gail fudged up a quote for us. You guys can check all this out. I see some people coming in and out of the uh, the stream. Head on over to BibleVersionConspiracy.com slash Spell it out, Westcott and Hort, as one word. And there's information that we're going to keep adding to this page as we make new discoveries and as we um, as we keep expanding the material on this Westcott and Hort debate, because there is a lot going on, guys, a lot. And I'm not going to go through the Textual Confidence Collective and throw up everything that they say and everything else like this. This is a Bible version conspiracy, and I want to bring in the things that relate to it. And uh, when there's pieces that I'm like, you know, okay, I want to make a little bit of a catalog here, a list, then maybe I'll refer, if there's some good spots in the uh, Textual Confidence Collective video, add a link or something like this. But I really wanted to dive in on that one specifically, because it was about the inerrancy of Scripture. And if we're talking about Bible translations, that's pretty important. If you guys have any other things that you want to add about the uh, this whole debate, please go right ahead. I have apparently been so magnetic and uh, captivating that there are no comments. But if you guys care to comment in the YouTube live stream, I will definitely see it. And I may or may not see them in Facebook. So just so you guys know. In other words, this is basically what Hort was or Westcott was saying. Quote, now this is in my own words. If I follow my true convictions, I can't say the scriptures are infallible. I, too, have many unanswered questions. I do, however, hold that they are absolutely true regardless of my doubts. That's my rephrasing of what he said. If you think that that's an inaccurate rephrasing, let me know and make sure that you read exactly what he said before you tell me what you think he said. <clears throat> Remember, we were originally led to believe that he was saying, quote, this is my rephrase of what he was supposed to have been saying. Of course, the Bible isn't infallible. Don't be a fool. That's what we were led to believe he was saying. And there's one other spot that I, I, I can mention just off the top of my head where the ellipsis marks just kill me with New Age Bible versions. I made a video about this a long time ago in the early days of this channel. One of my uh, few... Uh, short form content videos that it came earlier. I want to do more short form content, so stay tuned. But do you think this is a fair rewording? If you think Gail's edit of the quotation, do you think the edit of uh, Gail's edit of the quotation is justifiable? Do you, do you think that? Because if you do, I want to know why, because I would, I would find it very interesting. And I think that your perspective on that might just help me have a better perspective on the entire question. Let me know in the contact form below. And then we have a great big section on Westcott and charges of spiritualism. The uh, the last podcast, number 006, I believe it is by now, is about, was Brooke Foss Westcott a shape-shifting sorcerer? Was he a shape-shifter? Was he actually the Rosicrucian W.W. Westcott? There's a photograph of Westcott right there. There's more information on this graphic if you click that link right below his name that says his name and his year of birth and deceasement. And you guys can check out the information on that specific photograph. 
So we go through a lot of sorry, we go through a lot of stuff on. Oh, Mark Ward is repeating the same problem that James White initially came up with when he read uh, footnote 128 on New Age Bible versions. I believe it was still footnote 128 at that point, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So he's trying to unslander Westcott and then ends up making Gail Ripplinger feel like she was slandered. So this was Mark Ward and what he said in the description of one of the recent videos about it. And there's what James White said about it. Personally, I don't know if I want to jump into this right now. We've gone about 55 minutes. There's been no viewer interaction, which is really sad, but that's okay. Um, if you guys have a specific question that you want to nail me with, you guys can email me right here. Right there. You see the email address underneath my name? Go right ahead. BibleVersionConspiracy at gmail.com. For now, that's my email address. You can reach out to me there. Or if you know me on Facebook, send me a message. That works too. Send up a smoke signal. Just make sure it's daylight so I can see it. All righty. Back to the page. We get really deep on this one. So the infiniteness note 128. We have screen captures of where the note is mentioned, the first part of the note, and the second part of the note, where she disclaims having there, there being any influence on the work of W.W. W. Westcott in her description of B.F. Westcott. So if you're a new version person or whatever, and you're constant and, and, and you're recycling the James White stuff on W.W. W. Westcott, please stop. It is so painful to hear. Please stop. It is not true. You need to do your research and you need to look at the book that you don't like. You know, we try to look at all the books that we don't like. You guys need to do your due diligence, in my opinion. Now, this is under the section called White's Legally Actionable Lies. We actually posted this just recently on the Facebook page, Friends of Gail Ripplinger. And Bryn responded with basically uh, the same copy and paste sort of thing, if I remember correctly, from uh, Blind Guides about the whole question of W.W. W. Westcott. Because I provided a screen capture of, which is right here on the right, of the section in Blind Guides with the little cartoon and everything still in it. And a little link to where you can actually download a PDF of Blind Guides underneath it. And I've got to figure out how to get the dark teal page numbers to go away. Especially since I use the darker backgrounds very often. So that's where she talks about what White said about, um, about her book. And she thinks that his idea is that she just completely referenced... W.W. W. Westcott the entire time and all of his weird quotations came from W.W. W. Westcott. An actual, legit Rosicrucian sorcerer, everything you want to throw at him. Spiritualist would be the least of his descriptions, honestly. And I personally think that her words were a little harsh and they probably make you think, man, what's her problem? But the thing is, is that she thinks that James White is just taking every opportunity to make up something and lie about her book. Saying that all of her quotations from from uh, from B.F. Westcott were from some Rosicrucian named W.W. W. Westcott because of a, a remotely interesting observation that was made in a footnote for crying out loud. So she was real upset about it. But he didn't actually claim that all of her quotations were from W.W. W. Westcott. Now, did he? He said. <clears throat> when reading statements, uh, White's statement carefully dispels the confusion. Quote, her confident statements about Westcott and Hort being spiritualists are based upon pure speculation on her part. Did she ever say, now what I'm saying about Westcott and Hort, that is them being spiritualists, that is the only thing in question, is her calling them spiritualists at, I believe it was one 
spot. And she probably called him multiple times. But the actual term spiritualist is only supported by her from one quotation from her, his son, Ar Ar Arthur Westcott, which I think was also taken out of context, which is sad. Oh, look at that. Spray arm. Oh, Carl the cat is not here. I'm sorry. He's outside with Jin Jin. I'm sorry. I got I got to make like a Carl the cat t-shirt with him wearing like a tinfoil hat or something. That would be cute. Did she ever say how what I'm saying about Westcott and uh, now what I'm saying about Westcott and Hort that is them being spiritualists is merely speculation on my part? No. She made her assertions directly and without qualification. It's sad how a lack of communication between James White and Gail Ripplinger, no communication whatsoever. They had like one discussion on a radio program once, and that was it. Gail Ripplinger has been out of the public scene forever. She refuses to debate anybody. You're lucky if you can get an email back from her if you disagree with her about anything. You've got to be like, you know, like a friend like me or 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 somebody else that believes the King James Bible and is just has a little question or whatever to get a response. It seems like it seems like just about everybody that would reach out to her, she just you just don't hear back. It's really sad. And I think that if there was more clear communication between a, a criticized person and the person criticizing instead of just writing books back and forth and stuff, which people aren't actually reading and people can misrepresent so easily. In a heated debate like this, it just makes for a lot of bad circulation, a lot of a lot of bad tastes in people's mouths. And it's just really sad because there is so much confusion that wouldn't exist here that and I wouldn't have to talk about it. I could talk about, you know, a bazillion other things relating to this controversy instead of going back and untying old, what is it, Phrygian, old, whatever it was, knots, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't have to go back and untie all these crazy little knots that are left behind. You guys can go and read this on our page. BibleVersionConspiracy.com slash, spell it out, West Cotton Hort as one word. A little theory about if he was a master of disguise, if he was W.W. Westcott, like one other person besides Gail Ripplinger. And she said, I'm not alone in blind guides. I really don't think, I honestly don't think that she ever thought that W.W. Westcott was B.F. Westcott. I honestly don't think that she ever thought that. But... There was a lady that she knew from Jeremiah Productions or something. A really hard name to pronounce. Um, and apparently she thought that W.W. Westcott could have been B.F. Westcott. And I think that there's a possibility that somebody can be another person and that it could have been B.F. Westcott and W.W. Westcott. But there's, in my opinion, no necessity for it. Because B.F. Westcott and W.W. Westcott both had public personal appearances, and one would have to go through a lot of work to look like the other, that's for sure, or hire an actor. But I mean, really, just changing two initials, Brooke Foss to uh, William Wynn, and then leaving your last name the same, that's like the equivalent of Superman putting on glasses and going, oh, I'm obviously not Superman. Oop, I tripped on something. You know, huh, huh, I'm not Superman. I've got glasses on stuff. Superman doesn't have glasses. It, it would be the lamest, lamest cover name in history. And you guys can check out more books even by William Wynn Westcott on there. And here's a question that I have. If you are a person that uses the William Wynn of B.F. Westcott criticism of New Age Bible versions, here's a question for you. If she did conflate William Wynn and Brooke Faust, Wiley Waskell or Wacky Walrus Westcott, with Best Friend or Barney Fife Westcott, if she conflated them together, how come all she got out of it was that he was a spiritualist? Honestly, think about it for a second. Hi, Daniel. He says hi to everyone. 
thanks for coming on. Sorry that we're doing an earlier stream at 9 instead of 10, but Q&As I try to make a little earlier. So if you haven't technically missed anything, if you want to, you can go back and rewatch it. I appreciate the six people that are here now. We started out with zero. It was, I was very sad. Okay. So... If you're using the uh, WW and the BF conflation argument still, why is it? <clears throat> why is it that she only said spiritualist? Because he, William Wynne Westcott, was far from just being a spiritualist. So far. He was a, a deep Kabbalist, Rosicrucian, um ceremonial magician best friends with helena blavatsky just absolutely crazy stuff that he was in translating these strange books these ancient hebrew books like the um what was it the sefer oh i forget what it's called the symbol that we used for the background of this section is the same symbol from one of its publications as a book. The Book of Beginnings or Creation, basically. Um, basically, Kabbalistic principles for creating something. One of the, one of the claims that is uh, made surrounding it is that Abraham used magic to create the cow that he served to the three angels just before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's like a Luciferian or a Satanist saying that you should become a vampire because Lazarus, who was raised from the dead by Christ, was raised as a vampire because he lived after he died. That's like the equivalent weird stories. It's, it's, you know, it's like you just make things up as you go, it sounds like. That reminds me of a story. <sighs> Giacoppo Leone. Jesuit in training. His superior was like, hey, knocking on the door, let me in. And he's just like working on his thing. And he's like, one, one second, finishes his thing he's doing, goes over, opens the door. Hey, you chief or what have you. And his superior barks at him. Oh, why don't, why didn't you open the door immediately? That's what you're supposed to do and stuff. Because, you know, he's going through this gradual, you know, like like a military, a, a mind control kind of thing where you're, you know, super disciplined and under their thumb completely. And uh, he's like, there, there was a, a young, uh, young priest who, uh, when his superior knocked on his door, he uh, rose up quickly and left off in the middle of a word when he was in, when he was you know, inscribing something, copying a book or a scripture or what have you, left it off in the middle of the word. Went, and greeted his superior cheerfully, came back to his desk to resume his work, and found that God and his angels were so pleased with his direct obedience that they finished, either it was the word or the whole page or something. They finished the rest of it in golden ink. That's what those kind of stories remind me of. Stories like that. Giacoppo Leone laughed in his superior's face and said, ha, save those kind of, you know, fairy tales for old women. All right. It would be frustrating not being able to get an answer from Ripplinger. It seems like she could easily clear up <clears throat> any misunderstandings if she wanted to. I mean, why not? I don't know why it is. I'm sure that she has a pious reason for it. But I really don't. I don't. I don't understand. I don't. Um, let's see. So, yes. She really should. But I think maybe there's some parts 
like the quotation that we just looked at a minute ago, there may be some parts that um that she actually knows are screwed up, but I hope that this isn't the case. I hope she's not too afraid to actually come out and tell the truth about them. I hope that she's not. Because that one quotation that we just looked at from the Life and Letters of Brooke Foss Westcott, page 207, <clears throat> that one about infallibility, that is just completely changed for New Age Bible versions. I don't know. I really don't know. But I am not looking forward. I will tell you right now. Publicly, I am not looking forward to asking Gail about that quotation. And I already know, based on experiences that I've had in the past, I already know that I have to word it so carefully. Or else I'm either going to either uh, get some kind of really, uh, you know not necessarily the nicest reply sometimes, you know, terse or short-sighted, or I don't know what you want to, how you'd want to describe it, or just downright run the risk of not getting a reply. Making this video right now, actually, I'm kind of concerned because I'm almost positive that if either Bryn or Gail watches this, or um, Stephen, I'm probably going to end up with an earful. <sighs> Just saying. Daniel Jones, no problem. I checked out some of Mark Ward's video, and I could be wrong, but it seems to me like they wanted to defend Westcott and Ward's nuanced reasons for not accepting the infallibility of the Bible. I agree. It is it is super nuanced. They do seem like in those different parts that they just want to be like, you know, oh, it's nothing to worry about. But what I'm starting to ask in my mind is how much it really is to worry about. They are very clear in the uh, the video a little bit later on and toward the end that they're just like, you know, we're not here to say that everything that Westcott and Hort believed is absolutely fine. We're saying that we disagreed with them on a lot of things too, but you've been told that they rejected the Bible. They rejected the deity of Christ, which I would, I would love to see information that supports that, um, that they reject the blood of Christ, that they denied the cross, that they worshiped Mary, that they, they, um, they, uh, uh, you know, thought that you couldn't be saved without baptism, which is basically an Anglican thing across the board. Even Lancelot Andrews, they provided some quotes from. Which I'm not sure how incredibly accurate those were because of the ellipsis marks that they included, but, you know. Um, they're just like, you know, we don't want you to think that they were occultists, spiritualists, what have you. We want the truth to be out there, and if they were occultists and spiritualists, I'm pretty sure that we would know. The uh, the guy, uh, I forget his first name, but his last name is Berg. He's actually done a lot of research on Westcott and Hort, and get this, he would preach as a young person. He was King James only. Him and Mark were, Ward were both raised King James only. And remember, this is this is Bible version conspiracy. We're not here to display our quiet and slow uh, uh, conversion to Mark Wardism or something. I'm here to say that as King James Bible believers, if we're trying to place all the blame on Westcott and Hort and completely forgetting about the actual modern conspiracy that is against the Bible that is leading to a new world religion by changing keywords that is admitted in the uh, New Order of Barbarians in 96 and then moving forward. If we're just to keep beating the dead horses of Westcott and Hort and ignoring what's actually going on, then uh, we need to reconsider Westcott and Hort 
and uh, be a little bit more wary of things that don't involve West Cotton Hort, maybe. Maybe we need to shift our focus. Maybe we're being distracted by the West Cotton Hort rhetoric, the West Cotton Hort debate. But here's the thing about Berg. He said all the same things about West Cotton Hort. All the same things. He was an intelligent young man. He talked a lot about, you know, oh, they were, you know, they were, they were spiritualists. They were occultists. They were, they, they denied the infallibility of scripture and the virgin birth and blah, 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 everything else. They denied everything that had to do with Christianity whatsoever. They were the worst Anglican priests in history. And one day was at a library. Um, I believe it was at his college in uh, an apologetics kind of uh, uh, society that had like a whole bunch of commentaries all over the place and things. And he couldn't remember if it was the epistle of John, the epistles of John or the gospel of John commentary by Westcott, but he got it down and he was like, dude, <clears throat> and this goes in, this comes out later on in the video that I shared um, um, on our, our YouTube feed uh, in the community tab. And he gets down this book, Commentary by Westcott, and he's like, ha, going to get some more, get some more ammunition from on this creep. Ha, 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 ha. So he starts reading it. And he's just like. This guy is not a, he's not a spiritualist. He's not denying the deity of Christ. He's a. He's. This is amazing biblical reading. This. What is going on? And he said that he felt. He felt God pointing down at him like, dude, you've been lying about a dead man for years. Why didn't you bother to check to see if you were passing on correct information about somebody and he was just like and he said that he uh, there was this room there that he used to use as a as a prayer closet just kind of a, a room with no windows that was just kind of off to the side and he's just like you know every once in a while when he needed to pray he just kind of went over there and he said i need some time with jesus right now so he just went over to the closet got down on his knees and started crying his eyeballs out because he realized what he'd been saying about west cotton hort for years was not true and now he has read uh, all of bergen's books some of them several times he has read all of the works of Foss westcott all the life and letters he's actually read them and he offers i think a valuable opinion about these people now if we don't if we aren't able to keep saying that westcott and hort were evil spiritualist homosexual there were all this stuff if we're not able to say that King James onlyism does not come crumbling down, but our perspective of some King James only teachers and uh, whether or not they were completely responsible about certain things, that does come into serious question. Anyways, no, not anyways. That's that's an important thought. Maybe it is because she'd she's had so many people attack her for so long, which is true, that she is extremely defensive about all questions at all. You're right. That's exactly how it is. In my opinion, I couldn't have said it better. That's that's right. <sighs> which brings me to a subject that I've not talked about publicly in years and this is where i'm gonna get embarrassed but i want to be honest with you guys i want to be honest years ago and this video is now privated years ago i started a project with the blessing of gail ripplinger to make an audiobook and i've got the whole email exchange back and forth between us I was going to make it for free. It was going to be freely available for people. People would be able to read it and listen to New Age Bible versions at the same time. And it was going to be great. And later on, I was like, this is an incredible endeavor. 
it is exhausting. It is tedious. It is, I'm breaking my brain over this thing. I worked on that thing for years. And I, I it was just so painful that I would put it off for months at a time, just being like, I don't want to have to go back in and do this. The AI trying to copy and paste, and you guys have no idea how you have to set up with this software. It was called Speech Ello at that time. And then it was Revoicer, which is basically just kind of a revamp of Speech Ello, it seems. And you've got no idea the work that it takes. If you've never done it before, you don't know. If you're not a designer, you don't know the work that it takes to design. If you're not a photographer, you don't know the work that you need to put in to produce just one good photograph. If you're a writer, if you're not a writer, you don't know what it takes to create a book, an actual legit book that's published and everything. And on paper, you've got no idea if you don't know, if you've not done it. If you know, you know. Making an audiobook and restructuring things from copy and paste and uh, words that it won't read, like the word read, it says read every time. So every time it says the word read, you have to change it to R E E D, like it's grown out of pond. Just and when it came to words that it had a hard time pronouncing, you had to try to misspell them. And sometimes you'd have to try three or four or five or ten times. I literally had to try probably about a dozen times on a word that was unpronounceable for this poor software to try to finally get it so it pronounced it correctly by misspelling it. And changing text that because it wouldn't, you know, like, like New Ager, it would say New Ager. And it would just be like, oh my goodness. So you'd have to be like, it won't say ager. I, there's no way I can get it to say ager. So I have to change it to new age follower or new age cultist or something else like this. It was an absolute, it was absolutely crazy. A few chapters in, I was just like, I am not doing this for free. There are 30 some chapters in this book. I can't do this. It is, a, it is insane and it is miserable trying to produce this thing. So I was like to Gail, <clears throat> I was like, hey, <clears throat> I'm not going to mention her name. There's a young lady that loves New Age Bible version. She's super passionate about it. And uh, she wants to read it. She, I saw that she makes audiobooks. She's done it professionally. She does an excellent job reading with her expression and her emotion and everything else like this. I've got some recordings that she's done as samples. This is great. She will narrate it for a fee. And my plan at the time, and people helped us be able to get the AI software for my feeble attempt at trying to make an audiobook out of a 700 page book it was absolutely miserable trying to accomplish and I, I thank you very much for helping me try to do that but i'm sorry that it didn't work out and now uh, with um with the the lady that was going to narrate it I was like, okay, so she'll do it for a certain amount. And she was giving us an insane deal, a fantastic price on this project. Let me uh, switch out William Wayne here. I don't know if we need that right now. There we go. She's willing to read, and this, this book is huge, and it's going to take a lot of money to actually do it. And she was only going to charge us $3,000, which is not bad for the project. Not at all. She, she could have been charging us eight or 9000 or more. But she wanted to give us a deal. And uh, I was like to Gail, I was like, you know, here's my plan. Laid it out for her. One little problem. One teensy-weensy little problem. 
she wasn't going to do it for free. I was offering to raise the money for it from crowdfunding. There are thousands of people out there that would love to see an audiobook of New Age Bible versions. And they would donate to it, and I knew it. People loved the idea when I was going to make one from AI. They gave the necessary funds for me to be able to afford the software to create it, not to pay me while I did it, but just to give me the ability to make it. Because I knew I couldn't read it all. So I knew that there was there were the people out there that would want to contribute. And Gail was like, absolute refusal. There's probably some legal reason or some tax reason or who knows reason. But the holy reason that she gave me, that's probably the actual reason, is she is, you know, She's usually pretty pretty legit about things like this. Is that she wanted it to be uh, as a ministry or as a hobby or whatever. And if somebody uh, someday was going to bless her with a free audiobook that was created... It was going to be like a, um, what was that guy's name that would like pray for the food or whatever, and then the food would show up on the doorstep. Oh, Mueller. She wanted everything to be a, a Mueller kind of experience. And I was just like, <clears throat> okay, so she doesn't want to do crowdfunding. And uh, I was like, well, actually, I hadn't laid out the plan. I had just mentioned crowd crowdfunding. So just to give you a clearer picture. I mentioned crowdfunding and she said, no, we're not doing crowdfunding. And I was like, OK, well, here here is my plan just to lay it all out for you. If there's anything else wrong with it, you know, you'll be able to let me know. Laid out all the plan. And. Uh, Kind of got my head bit off. Obviously, you didn't read our first email. Cease and desist from all involvement in this project and stuff like this. And I'm just like, okay. So, short of uh, uh, people helping uh, create a New Age Bible version audiobook, um, and short of uh, Miracle, there may be a miracle at some point. That would be that'd be cool. That'd be really cool. Like if somebody has like 40 daughters or something and they each want to read a chapter or something like this, then okay. Or if an entire church wants to get involved, just throwing out ideas. If each person wants to take a chapter and throw it together and into into an audiobook or what have you. <clears throat> but Gail Ripplinger, just so you know, is not going to sell it on her website. Or at least that's what she told me in the emails. So, at least from what I understand. Maybe I'm misunderstanding the entire thing. Who knows? So I highly doubt that there's going to be a New Age Bible version audiobook at any point in time. Before it goes into the public domain with the death of everybody related to Gail Ripplinger, because that's apparently when it goes into the public domain. I don't know. I don't know about all the legal stuff. I don't know about all the back end stuff with the stuff that they deal with and everything else like this. I'm talking off the top of my head from my experience. Don't take anything that I say that seriously, okay? But the thing is, is didn't really have a positive experience with that. <clears throat> I know the lady that wanted to narrate it was very hurt by the uh, the uh, de-escalation of that project and um, that she was greatly looking forward to it, not just to earn the money, but because she was super passionate about the project and uh, she was sad to not be working with us on it. Anyhow, now you know what happened to the New Age Bible Versions audiobook project. Got squished like an ant on the counter. Let's see.
Uh, let's see. Not sure if it makes sense, but to me, the problem is that West that that Hort wouldn't just accept God's word, but had to rely on himself and scholarship to prove the infallibility of God's word. I'm not sure that he had to have the infallibility of God's word proven to him. I am not sure. It's hard to tell, especially with Hort. Westcott, you know, was a bit different from the uh, the perspective that we gather from Berg, <clears throat> which is not a perspective that we get from New Age Bible versions or any other King James only author that I am aware of. Nobody has taken the time and the dedication to actually study Westcott and Hort. They usually take a couple of paragraphs to say they're the meanest, rottenest, stinking occultist, pseudo-Anglicans that ever existed, and now their text is bad. And then never use a new version, King James. And that's about that's about the that's about what you get about West Cotton Hort. So there's a lot of things that I want to look at from Seitler. There's a lot of things still in New Age Bible versions that I want to paw through. Um, especially with the the gross misquotation of that infallibility quote and just how the the cover up with no ellipsis marks and changing the uh, the ends of words and stuff and it's just, it was just absolutely disgraceful. With that having been the case, I want to see everything now. Uh, let's see. I may just be understand uh, mis uh, misunderstanding their quote though. I need to do more investigation and listen to Ward's video again. Probably not a bad idea. I would appreciate any feedback that you guys have on it because right now I'm just like wow. So. <clears throat> Yeah, this is learning publicly, and we're learning a lot about the, uh, and, and, and this is one of the reasons that we have this channel. We're going to the King James only arguments, we're going to the anti-King James only arguments, and we're going, hey, I want to see it for myself. Are you right? Are you right? Are you both right? Are you both wrong? Sorting through these matters, untying these knots, and going, I think that there is an actual conspiracy going on. And I'm not sure that it's not active on the King James only side and on the modern version people side. Personally, I think that there is somebody that's holding the jar full of red ants and black ants, which are perfectly happy together, and then shaking it. And then their black ants and red ants are killing each other. So the King James only ants are killing the modern version ants. And the real enemy is the one that's shaking the jar, which we're completely ignoring. Sacrificing in effigy, West Cotton Hort, daily in Facebook comments, on YouTube videos, sometimes in pulpits, in little books, in little articles and stuff. Were they scapegoats for a larger agenda? I don't know. But I think it's a pretty strong possibility at this point. So, if you guys want to follow this whole development thing on a little bit of a deeper level, check out that Buy Me a Coffee link in the description. And I'd appreciate it. <clears throat> Become a co-conspirator like Daniel Jones here. Daniel Jones is a co-conspirator. Be like Daniel Jones. So... Um, in an audiobook of New Age Bible versions would be would have been great. I'm surprised that Ripplinger hasn't made one herself by now. She probably doesn't have the ability to do it with her health conditions, but to my understanding, her son Stephen, or son, son-in-law Stephen, uh, Bryn's husband, he, I guess has produced audiobooks several times in the past, and apparently he was planning to do a New Age Bible versions audiobook, but then I think we kind of stepped in, and he was just like, okay, well, I guess he can do it. I've got a lot of other things to do, and I just got totally overwhelmed. It was just like, oh my goodness, I can't do this by myself, and and and, and I, I tried. Guys, I tried so hard, and it was just, if you want to do it, you go right ahead. I ain't touching it. I ain't touching it. I recommend you get a better microphone. Thank you. <laughs> I'm also a little ways away. 
I recommend you get I recommend you getting a better microphone. The sound is very thin and stinging for the ears. It's hard to explain, but a more balanced, bassier, blump audio would help. Thank you, because I've been wanting to buy a new microphone, and I think I might actually possibly have the money to buy one now, which is great. So, in case, because I, you seem to be somebody that at least is familiar with audio, which I appreciate. What would you think... You can look it up. You can get back to me, whatever you want to do. I want to get the Rode PodMic USB. Because for my setup, this is this is a cell phone right here. This is the camera on my cell phone, the selfie camera. That's what I use for streaming. <clears throat> and then a secondary screen is my ancient laptop that seems to hate me half the time. So for that setup, we kind of need a USB mic, and what I would like to get is the U is the uh, the the Rode Pod mic USB. That's my next per my next big purchase coming down the line here. Outside of a new computer, which is going to need a money behind it, and just ay ay ay. If you guys want to go to our wish list on our Buy Me a Coffee page, you guys can add a little bit of something there. Sprinkle a little sugar so we might be able to afford a new laptop someday that doesn't fight me at every corner. And most people have jobs that relate to technology these days. So since all of this has to do with technology, the only reason that this even operates is because of technology. You can understand that I would have a lot of frustrations that come around, especially with outdated tech. Oh, I'm getting nice little comments from a guy named Wesley Curry II. Hi, Wesley. I'm going to read your comments real quick um, because what you're saying seems a little trolly. So, in the last days, Jesus erased three times the false Bibles, the King James Version. Jesus did not erase. Okay. Okay. You have eyes, but you do not see. Ears, but you do not hear. Dude, you don't know what I see. You don't know what I hear. You don't. You don't know the truths that I'm privy to. You don't know the crazy things that I'm just learning and that I'm entertaining in my mind. You've got no idea. <clears throat> How? How are the false Bibles made? A voice told all of you, I will turn and toss you violently like a ball. And don't tell the vision. That voice was Satan. No, it doesn't. That voice also fooled men without writing the false Bibles. Telling the version, telling the vision of the foot cut off that did not did not bless from Jesus is how the 144,000 shall be saved in their holy crap dude okay so i've got a recommendation for you um calm down first second stop doing drugs third stop commenting on people's youtube videos until you stop doing drugs that's my advice I don't want to be rude, but dude, please, please get some help. <clears throat> All right. You mispronounced bleed as blessed. I uh, Like I said, you have eyes, but you do not see ears, but you do not hear. That's true. For all I know, you could be a ghost standing in the room looking at me. Who knows? But either way, you really taste trolly. Okay, so anything else that I wanted to talk about tonight? Oh, yes, I was going to wait until we had some people on here. And then I was going to ask a question. And it might be a good question for you, Wesley Curry. 
<clears throat> for those of you know that know what the initials SRA, what that is a um, acronym for. Satanic ritual abuse. There are a lot of signs of it and also of other types of things that happen that we don't know of. Some of these things may have happened to you in your lifetime, listener. Oh, this guy. I'm going out of the comments for a little bit until he goes away. <clears throat> There are signs of these problems. I'm going out of the comments there, too. Okay. There are signs of crazy things that happen that we don't want to think about, that we don't want to believe, that we've all heard. And they can happen to anybody. They can happen at a school. They can happen at a church. They may never be voiced. They're hard to process. But I really think that, and it would be very hard to make, but I think that we should make, I think we should make a an episode about the signs to look out for if SRA is part of your life. Please let me know what you think. If you guys want to learn about how to identify these things, there's so much that I still have to learn about it, and I'm not looking forward to learning about it. Different books that people have written. My primary source in my primary source in this endeavor would be the uh, the appendix from Bill Schneblin's book. Sorry if the troll is blowing up the chat. I'm just kind of I just kind of turned a blind a blind eye to it, and I just see a little bitty number going up and up and up, and I'm just assuming that it's him and trolling like trolls do. So, SRA. Would you want to see a podcast about that heavy and frightening subject? I'm not necessarily going to get into detailed descriptions any more than uh, Bill Schneblin does in his appendix of that simply gives a list of signs to look for, <clears throat> where scars would be present, where um, uh, what what kind of emotional damage would be done to a child. Um, what different things would they, how, how would they behave, um, different things like that. So maybe you can look at these sort of things in yourself or um, your own children, grandchildren, um, people at church, things like this. Um, because I will say that I believe very firmly that there is satanic ritual abuse in our churches, particularly in uh, Baptist churches. And that's a sad thing to say. Fundamental Baptist churches. Anyways. Ten comments now. I just, I just want to see if he's totally blowing it up. Oh, yeah, he's just going and going and going. Wow, look at this guy. All right, Daniel Jones. One vote, Daniel Jones. Spray Arms said it the other time, and their votes count for extra because they are co-conspirators. Jared, if you're out there, let me know. If you think that a... Uh, is Jared's my brother-in-law. Um, let me know if you think that we should do a thing on SRA. Hey, Wesley Curry the second, if you can talk about anything besides what you're talking about, who knows what it is? 
Would you want to see an episode on SRA? Probably not, because who knows? Anyways. Wow. Okay, dude. All right. So, we talked about Nick Sayers, the uh, thing that's going to be happening next week because his wife had um, some health issues. Please pray for her. Um, what will be going live on his show should be next Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock EST or EDT, Eastern Standard Time, Eastern Daylight Time. We went through the West Cotton Hort page a little bit. We'll be adding more to that in the future. We talked about the New Age Bible Versions audiobook project and what on earth happened to it. Oh, let's see. I'm actually going to be a little bit neater than this. And do text. Okay. So we did that and that and that. And are Westcott and Hort a cover for the real conspiracy? What do you think? What do you think? Do you think that Westcott and Hort are merely scapegoats? And that they really aren't the bad guys? I want to know if there is a podcast out there that deals specifically with SRA kind of things. I would love if Fritz Springmeier had a podcast. He's he's a guest very often, I guess, on podcasts and such. And what's their faces? Oh, man. What's that guy's name? It's a ministry. Bride. Bride Ministries. They, they've got a lot of crazy um, anti-Illuminati kind of prayers and stuff like this. It's just like, wow. And they've got some whacked out teachings that I might not agree with all the way, but I don't know. The world of the of the world of the crazy Illuminati, secret space program, twenty and back, whatever else like this. I just I, I can't wrap my head around it. So maybe they're right on some things. I don't know. Oh, let's see. Um, Daniel Jones. I think it's definitely possible that they were scapegoats. Cool. Very cool. We've been going for an hour and 50 minutes. Evanson. I like your concluding words for each stream. Read the Bible like the devil's after it. For there really is a Bible version conspiracy. I came up with that years ago. When I was making an end, an ending, an outro clip for a video that I made. I was wearing a shirt that is still hanging in my closet and I haven't worn since that says Bible version conspiracy. Conspiracy is separated on two lines. And uh, there, there's some merch that we've made too the, with that with that on it, but I've never really been crazy about any of it. You guys can check out the merch and see what you think. If you guys have any ideas for merch too, throw them right at me because, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking to uh, hone down our merchandise selections to one design or the other, salt and pepper. So we shall see. Oh, my goodness. And now some Chinese guy is going to start making – oh, my goodness. Okay. We've had it with the trolls, okay? Go away. <sighs> All right. Next podcast episode will be dropping, Lord willing, um, next Thursday. I will be in touch with uh, the uh, co-conspirators whom we will uh, live stream with um, after this for a brief meeting if you guys like. If you uh, don't want to do it tonight, please let me know in the chat, and uh, we'll do that. <clears throat> so uh, I don't think that I'm ready right now at all to tackle the topics that I want to tackle for the next podcast. It may be next week. It probably will be next week. Fingers crossed. We're going to have to see. May drop a couple of shorter videos or something like this. I'm not sure. And then just record next Friday. I don't know. But I don't have it in me right now to go for another hour and a half. 
So especially without having done the research for the Triketra. Is it a symbol for the Trinity or for the Antichrist? I'm also not prepared for the Peaceable Kingdom. Does a 200-year-old painting disprove the Mandela effect? And I'm also not prepared for the upcoming SRA podcast, which we just mentioned tonight. So, if you want to be, like I said, deeper level, join the co-conspiracy. Check out that link in the description. Buymeacoffee.com slash Joseph Armstrong. And we'll see you in the next stream. Keep that, keep that Bible up, you know. They make, it makes really good binoculars these days. And read your Bible like the devil's after it. Because it truly is. Ah, my brand. It's falling apart. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. I can't say it until I got the, the thing ready. Oh, you want to see something cool? Here, I'm just going to show you guys something cool quick before we go. If I have it, do I have it? I've got Gleam. Countdown. I, I don't have it. How do I? Oh, I don't have it. Ah, come back next time. Maybe I'll have it then. And uh, last Friday of every month, nine o'clock Friday. Last Friday of every, of every month. Join us for a live stream. Or if you're a member, um, every Friday night at ten. Every Friday night at ten. We go live for a recording of the podcasts that we air on Thursdays. Stay tuned. And like I said, read your King James Bible like the devil's after it. Because there truly is a Bible version conspiracy. Have a good night. We'll talk soon.